Okay, welcome everyone who's joined us over the last few minutes. Uh, we still have a few people popping in, uh, but in the meantime, my name is Cassidy Monroe. I am a community librarian with the Edmonton Public Library. And I am very excited to have so many of you joining us this evening for our Energy Talks online speaker series with Future Energy Systems. Um, I'm just gonna go over a few housekeeping things and I always like to remind people if they are from the Edmonton area that library cards are free. If you are a U of A member uh, or U of A student or staff member, you also have access to our entire collection and all of our services with your one card and you just need to register online as well. So it's called the LPAS because we think we're very witty, but we're not that witty. So, <laughs> um, so that's just my little plug for the library. Uh, and to always check out all of our other speaker series that we do online now throughout the month. Uh, I also want to mention, you may have noticed that we are recording this talk this evening. If you would like to ask questions or have any comments at any time, you're welcome to put them in the chat that won't be recorded on the video. So it can be done there and it'll be anonymous. Uh, you can also, you're welcome to pop onto video and ask a question that way. Just note that it may capture uh, your, your voice or your image if you have your video on. If you would like us to not record that, just say it at the beginning that I wanna ask my question, but I'd like to not be recorded. It makes it easier for us to edit it out later. Uh, with that, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Valerie, who is with Future Energy Systems to introduce our speaker this evening. Hello everyone, my name is Valerie and I am the Outreach and Engagement Coordinator for Future Energy Systems. Uh, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. The University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Future Energy Systems was launched in 2016 with a $75 million grant from the Government of Canada, Canada's first research excellence fund to help transition Canada to a low net carbon energy economy. We focus on multidisciplinary research that develops the energy technologies of the near future, integrates them into today's infrastructure and examines possible consequences for our society, economy and environment. We also contribute to the development of solutions for challenges presented by the current energy system. The Future Energy System has 105 research projects, over 650 graduate students, postdoctoral researchers and highly qualified personnel, and over 140 researchers. We wish, wish to remind current and future viewers that the opinions expressed by the speaker are not necessarily those of the Edmonton Public Library, Future Energy Systems, or the University of Alberta. So as Cassidy said, we will be having question periods tonight. Uh, so we'll be having one about halfway through. So if you have any questions, you can pop them in the chat or ask them at that point. And then again, we'll be pausing at the end of the talk for more discussion. So please get all your questions, ask them. We want this to be a really vibrant discussion. Uh, and now I'd like to invite our speaker, Dr. Juliana Lung, to uh, pop up on screen and share her slides and we're gonna get right into it. Thank you guys all for showing up tonight. Well, thank you Valerie for the introduction and hello everyone, good evening. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, talk and I'm very excited and thankful for this opportunity uh, to be able to speak to a broader audience about some of the work that is going on in the university um, in the area of cleaner heavy oil production. And most importantly, I hope by the end of this talk, you have some idea of how that may be related to um, uh, our day-to-day -day life in some way. So the uh, presentation is about solvents. So this is uh, an enabling technology uh, that we're working on for cleaner heavy oil production. So, and I have an outline for today's presentation. So I'll start off with an introduction. Uh, mostly want to give you a con the context of why this is an important problem and a little bit, and then followed by uh, an overview of heavy oil and bitumen extraction process, basically what we are doing and maybe highlight some of the potential uh, drawbacks, particularly in terms of the environmental footprint. Um, and then we 
we'll start to talk about uh, why do we need solvents and what are solvents and some of the techniques that we can use, uh, how we can use solvents in the process. Then uh, after that, we probably will take a break to take in questions. And then uh, after the question period, then we'll go back and explore a little bit more about the challenges of solvent technology. Um, there is, because you may be wondering if, if it is so great, how come we're not already using it everywhere? Um, so with that, in mind, then we can talk a little bit about the solutions that we can have and some of the research directions, for example, that are being pursued. And I'll conclude uh, with some remarks at the very end. So let's talk about, um, in general, I think, as I said, it's important to provide some context about why we are interested in cleaner heavy oil production. And if you look up a lot of the information online, particularly those that are published by, uh, for example, Natural Resources Canada, you can get information about uh, the amount of oil sand resource that we have. And Canada's oil sands are the third largest proven oil reserve in the world. So just behind Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. So if you take a look at this, so the statistics that they published was back in 2014. At that time, the total amount of reserves was about 171 billion barrels uh, uh, of oil for the entire Canada. So 165 billion of those are in bitumen and heavy oil reserves in Alberta. And if you think about how much oil are we producing from, from these bitumen and heavy oil resources, it's about um, 3.1 million barrels uh, per day. So I have some statistics. Like, so among that, uh, about 1.5 million barrels per day come from what we call uh, surface mining. Um, the other half comes from in situ recovery, which I will talk a little bit more about that. So, um, if you just, to give you an idea, in situ recovery would be the ones that you have to drill wells, whereas service mining would be the one that we use the truck to basically dig them out. And then there is um, also, so if you think of that, okay, we have all these oil and gas, and but do you think the world will still need them in the long run? So what I'm showing here is some uh, data that I have extracted from the World Energy Outlook published by the International Energy Agency or IEA. So just to give you a little bit of uh, background, IEA is actually a um, organization that is based in Paris. It was developed, uh, it was established in 1974 uh, under the framework of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So it's basically an intergovernmental organization. It serves as a policy advisor um, to its member states as well as an information source for statistics about um, energy outlook, uh, global energy markets, supply demand, and it's not limited to oil and gas, it's actually including all sort of energy uh, sources. Um, so every year they publish a, um, a document or a report, um, World Energy Outlook, which is widely recognized as a very um, reliable or authoritative uh, analysis of the global energy uh, projections. So what they usually do is that in that report, you, you, I mean, they actually just recently published it um, uh, in this a couple weeks ago. They will outline different scenarios. So one is called stated policy scenario. That's the one where basically they're assuming um, it reflects the current existing policies as well as any policy that's already been announced. So based on what is already in place, they will make a projection. So if you look at this particular case, what I have here on what I plot is the uh, million of tons of oil equivalent. So MTOE, millions of tons of oil equivalent. It's a unit of energy used to describe the energy content of all fuels. So just so that you have a basis of comparing different fuels. And, and then this is the projection. So, um, I only include the data from uh, 2018, 19, and 2020, uh, 2020. So you can obviously see that because of the pandemic, there's a dip. And then they projected it sort of kind of uh, increase a little bit and sort of level off all the way to 2040. And this is the scenario that you can maybe think of it as the most likely in some way, because it's based on existing policies and things that are already been announced. But they also include something called sustainable development scenario. This is one where it's almost like a very ambitious vision that 
if we wanted to achieve certain sustainable development goals, this is what we need to do. So they don't provide a pathway for doing that. It is more like a, this is the vision, this is where we want to go. And if we can get there, this is what it will look like. So in all of these, you can see that oil um, certainly doesn't disappear. It's still part of the uh, energy mix. Um, gas would also go up. Uh, in this uh, scenario here, you see that coal is still um, make up some portion of the, it, it will also still be there. And you can see something called low carbon fuels that's also increasing. So by their definition, low, car low carbon fuels are like biofuels. So it doesn't include the, the renew typical renewable like uh, wind or uh, hydro, uh, nuclear, that type of, uh, or solar. Whereas if you look at the sustainable development one, then you can see that it, it may go down for the oil. Um, the low carbon fuels would uh, obviously become more important and, and gas may also go down a little bit and coal definitely will go down. But I think the message is that even in that scenario, oil, gas and coal are still there. It's hard to um, get rid of them completely. and. So that's that's kind of like the the, the idea that I, I I wanted to show you is um, that it did these fuels will still be an important part of the energy mix. Now I think maybe another thing just to mention that if you're wondering like if um, what about if we do include uh, renewables, the the hydro and the um, maybe wind and solar, how would that come up with? So I didn't plot it here, but I have another. Uh, uh, I'm just gonna kind of mention that so. If you think of including those, you might add another maybe 3,500 or 40 uh, or 4,000 uh, million of tons of oil equivalent of energy from those. So in those scenario, then even in the sustainable development scenario, you might have maybe oil would make up about a quarter, uh, gas another 20%, coal maybe 10%, and all the renewables, uh, the biofuel and the low carbon fuels and everything combined would be about 45%. So even in that scenario, you'll find that um, oil and gas would still be an important part of, of the energy mix. So in that case, and let's kind of go back and talk a little bit about what is bitumen and heavy oil because Canada have so much of that, um, what are they? Maybe some of you already, if you're uh, working in the oil and gas industry, maybe you're already familiar with that. Um, but for the for everybody else, maybe it's good to sort of define what is a bitumen and heavy oil. So it is a crude oil that is basically composed of a lot of complex heavy hydrocarbons. So think of it as hydrocarbons. These are uh, molecules with a lot of carbon atoms and then also a lot of uh, hydrogen atoms and they are some long complex uh, chains among them so they're big molecules they're heavy so that's why they have high density and we often use something called API gravity to measure density so if you're not familiar with that um, it's actually very simple API gravity if it's equals to 10, it means that something is exact, has the exact same density of water. So if it's less than 10, it is heavier than water. So if I put something less than 10 API gravity on top of the water, it will sink. But if it's greater than 10, then it will float on top. So to just give you an idea, like conventional uh, crude would usually have an API gravity maybe like a 35 or 40. And for bitumen, so really extra heavy oil, it will be something less than 10. So high density is one characteristics of uh, a bitumen or heavy oil. The other one is it is maybe the most important one is that it is extremely viscous. So by viscous, I mean something that is thick. It doesn't flow easily. So just to give you an idea to sort of visualize what is viscous. So in um, when we talk about viscous, uh, how viscous it is, we, we call that this is the viscosity. So this is, uh, if, if something have a high viscosity, it means it's very viscous. If it has low viscosity, it, it um, it's not very viscous. So if you think about say like at room temperature, 20 degree, 
water would have a viscosity of one. So the unit is centipoise, but just think of it as if water is one, toothpaste would be about 70,000. So you, we all use toothpaste, so I'm sure you can imagine how thick it is. With bitumen, it would be in the order of 10,000, uh, sorry, 100,000 to a million uh, centipoise. So it is even thicker than uh, toothpaste. So the, um, and you know, and sometimes we kind of say bitumen heavy oil, I, I, we seem to use it interchangeably, but if you actually uh, really define it, um, we usually say when something is a heavy oil, if we think of its viscosity, it's usually about 10,000 to 100,000. So more on the kind of the, um, it's still uh, viscous, but not as viscous as the range that I have listed here. Bitumen typically refer to something that is in the order of, of this one, so like 100,000 to a million centipoise. So the problem with things being viscous is obviously it doesn't flow very easily. So I, um, if you're thinking about conventional crude and conventional oil, the way we would produce is it, we drill a well, and at the well, we just lower the pressure. And it's like opening a faucet. The oil would just flow to the well, and then you pump it up to the surface. But if you think about this type of fluid, they are so viscous, even if you open up the faucet, it's not going to flow. It's just like if you, you know, open up the cap of a toothpaste tube, the nothing is going to flow out. You have to squeeze it for the toothpaste to come out. But I cannot squeeze the rock to get the oil out. I have to do something else. So that is basically the challenge with bitumen or heavy oil uh, production. So I think the key messages I wanted to have uh, in this introduction is to kind of show that the uh, global energy demand will continue to increase. And if you look at any of the forecasts, um, particularly in regions where in developing countries where having reliable energy source is still a challenge. And we always knew that um, your quality of living is often related to your access to reliable energy. So that global de demand will always continue to increase. The other thing is um, technology takes time. So uh, a lot of the research and development is going into um, creating new and reliable renewables uh, for future energy, but that development takes time. And that's why all these forecasts are showing that oil and gas will still um, be an important part of the energy mix. It may not be as important as it is now. So if you think of uh, oil and gas maybe make up 50%, 60% of the global energy mix, it's all the forecasts likely will show that it won't be as important, but it won't disappear, at least in all these forecasts that has been shown. And even if people may say that oh, oil may peak within the next decade or so, but you can see even though as it peaks, it doesn't mean that it will just go to zero. After it peaks, it basically just sort of level off or maybe it just drop a little bit. And technology takes time. I think by now we can all appreciate that statement because I was just, as I was preparing that, I was thinking right now, I think everybody on everybody's mind is to have a vaccine, right? Lots of research and, and government has put in money everywhere. It's putting money to have the vaccine and we want it like right away. But still, we don't have it right now because to develop a technology certainly takes time. So if you can imagine that for any other solutions that we need for the society, you have a similar problem. So in the meantime, as we transition to maybe a global energy mix that has more renewables, um, we probably should look for ways to have cleaner oil production. And given that oil and gas will remain as an important energy source, and Alberta has a lot of it. The problem is just that it is a little difficult to produce it. So is there anything that we can do about that? So I think um, with that, I, the motivation for a lot of the uh, content that I'm gonna uh, present later on is that maybe in the future, if we're thinking about the moving forward should be, yes, continue with the renewable energy and also try to mitigate the CO2 emissions from our uh, from using um, oil and gas, but also in producing the oil and gas. So with that, uh, before I introduce the solvent, I think I should at least 
kind of over, give an overview about how the existing heavy oil enrichment extraction process so that you have an idea of what, what we currently do and how solvent may come in and what role that solvent can play. So here's a, a picture. So if you imagine that this is a, a this is sort of, uh, this is at the surface. So I have some trees to kind of illustrate that. And then this is what we see underground. If the resources is deposited uh, within the first maybe 75 meter from the surface, then we can do something called uh, mining. So we can do surface mining. So we can have a truck to go in and dig it out and we, take out the sand and the oil that is in there and then take it and then we can go and process it. And often after we process it, uh, the, the waste will go into um, something called, the waste are called like the tailings. So they put in these tailings ponds so that the um, they will allow the um, things to settle. So that's just one, one option of producing these uh, bitumen. So it usually recovers, we, the estimate generally, the consensus is about 20% of all the resources that we have. The other 80% are buried very deep. So you cannot really just keep digging and digging. They can be deposited anywhere from about 75 meter all the way to maybe like 800 meter. And those are the buried so deep that we have to do in situ recovery. So in situ recovery would be um, drilling wells. So you have to drill wells and then to extract it. And that's basically what we have. So um, we have, if many of you may be familiar, we have deposits in the Peace River area, the Coal Lake, um, Athabasca deposit that's kind of near the uh, Fort McMary. And that's, uh, kind of the, the deposit that we are kind of looking at. And the kind of picture that I wanted to show, this is not specifically a, um, in, a heavy oil bitumen extraction well, but often what we do is we, uh, when we drill well, that we will drill multiple wells out of the same surface location from one surface pad. So um, so that's usually what, what we will do with that. So here's the one of the most common technique we use to uh, do the in situ recovery. And this is called steam assisted gravity drainage, or we call it SEG-D. So this is a schematic of how it works. So as I mentioned, often we have a single service pad location. So we can drill multiple sets of wells from that to minimize the uh, disturbance to the, um, to the surface, but also um, to make things more efficient. So what we'll do is we'll drill two wells and we will drill it down all the way from the top to the target zone that we like. And then from that, we'll drill a horizontal well. So basically we um, make the well bore kind of turn and then it go uh, horizontally sort of parallel to the surface roughly. And it will be usually uh, about a, a thousand meters in, in length. And these two wells are about five meters apart near the bottom of the zone that we are targeting. So what we do is that in the injector, so the top wells, I'm going to inject steam. So I'm going to inject the steam and then the steam will heat up everything around it. And then on the producer at the bottom, I will have oil and condensed water because you're injecting some really hot steam into a cold reservoir. So the steam will just condense and then it will become water and then it will all flow to the well in the bottom. So this is uh, the most common technique that is being applied nowadays in SACD. Now you might wonder, uh, are there any other techniques? Well, yes, there's also another one that is not as popular, but also quite widely uh, adopted is called the cyclic steam stimulation or CSS. So in this case, we only drill one well. So same kind of configuration. There's a drill down to the target and then you have a horizontal portion to it. And then what you do is you inject steam. Then you're gonna stop and you're gonna wait. So you're gonna let it soak for some time. And then you will say, okay, after that, I'm going to use the same well and just open it up and let whatever the oil and condensed water be produced and then bring it back. So this is one cycle. What you will do is you will just keep repeating this cycle again and again. And that's why it's called uh, cyclic steam stimulation. 
So by doing so, you just use one well and then you keep doing the injection, soaking and then uh, producing. Now soaking is important. It's I think just like, you know, when we are trying to clean out some really dirty dishes, what we usually do is we, you know, put some soap, you know, put some water and let it sit in the sink for some time. And then after a while you, it comes out easier. So uh, the soaking is important because the what you need to give time for that steam to contact the reservoir and the oil so that uh, when you finish the soaking period, they will be produced in the producer. So why does steam injection work? Why do we always inject steam? Well, the problem is, as I mentioned, bitumen just doesn't flow easily because it is too viscous, but adding heat can help to reduce its viscosity. So on the here on this plot on the y-axis, so on this this uh, vertical axis, I, I plot the oil viscosity at atmospheric pressure. So um, nothing uh, sort of think of it as like room condition, right? So at the if you think about the low temperature about 15 degree uh, uh, Celsius, it is close to a million centipoise as we've shown earlier. But if you keep heating it up its viscosity will drop. You know, one is that for the water, and you can see it can drop um, quite a bit. So if you imagine this is sort of the starting point for a reservoir, and this will be the end point, usually around this uh, temperature. So the viscosity would be less than 10. Now it's not as uh, low as water, but this is definitely good enough to uh, produce it to the well bore. But what are some of the drawbacks of steam injection? Um, well, one is steam generation. Uh, to generate steam, we often burn natural gas and it has greenhouse gas emissions. Some companies or operators that talk about this, um, uh, what they're doing is also they, in the plant where they burn the natural gas, they also generate some electricity and they use that electricity to run the plant or, or send it back to the Alberta power grid, which is good. But Nevertheless, burning natural gas has greenhouse gas emissions. The other issues is also water usage, right? You are um, up to 90% of the water usually is recycled, but there's still some 10% that cannot be recycled. So um, if you're using a lot of water, these numbers kind of add up. Um, and also uh, recycling the water also use energy, right? So at the end, that's this, uh, uh, quite um, energy intensive process. So one of the measures that we use to say whether something is um, um, efficient or not, or this process is efficient or not, is something we use, we call steam oil ratio, uh, SOR. It's an indicator of efficiency. It measures both the water and energy consumption. So for example, if it's less than three, it means that it's pretty good. Uh, so some operators actually report a value of two. Um, two to five is sort of the range. So if you can keep it less than three, it's pretty good. The lower the ratio, the less uh, natural gas consumption, uh, because that means you are not injecting so much steam, so you're not burning natural gas. You are um, not uh, not having to recycle a lot of the water as well. Um, SOR, so give you an idea what that means. So SOR, if you say SOR is equal to two, it means it takes two barrels of water convert it to steam to produce one barrel of oil. So um, so if you take the steam, you condense it, you get two barrels of water, that's the, the two referring to, and for every barrel that you recover. So if you think about what sort of energy consumption and CO2 emissions, so I got some statistics from government of Alberta and also from, again, Natural Resources Canada. Uh, what they have is, um, so if you think about how to how much energy do I use to convert a barrel of water to steam oil, it's about one gigajoule. And um, approximately 0 0.06 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent for every barrel of bitumen that you produce. Um, and safety emissions are actually comparable to the combined emissions from mining and upgrading. So remember the other way of extracting bitumen is called surface mining. So after you mine these uh, uh, oil sands, you actually have to separate out the sand and then further upgrade it. And that's the, 
the part. So if you combine all of the emissions from that process and then com compare that to SAGD, you find that they are quite comparable. Uh, and if you just, uh, if you exclude that upgrading part, so just look at the non-upgraded mined bitumen extraction from surface mining, the ratio is about three to two. So um, and the, in the overall uh, can, total Canadian GHG emissions, and so they have the statistics from 2011, and that was about uh, less than 8% of the total greenhouse gas emissions and less than maybe about 0.1 of the global emissions. So then I think the next question would be, so, so why do we need solvents? Well, I think you can kind of see that is solvent technology basically offers um, an alternative to reducing the environmental footprint. So in terms of the carbon emissions and the uh, water usage. So imagine this, if I have the same configuration that I have before, so I'm also drilling these wells, but this time, instead of adding the steam, I'm gonna add something called solvents. Now solvents in this context refer to something that is light hydrocarbons or low molecular weight hydrocarbons. So think of it as um, propane, for example, um, or you can even use CO2. That's even better, right? Because that's a greenhouse gas. So if I can get rid of the steam and inject these into the reservoir, that, um, uh, that would be great. And this is the idea of solvent technology. And this particular process, we call it VAPEX, vapor extraction process. Now, so why is it more environmentally friendly? Well, for one, there's no steam um, generation and even steam generation has some capital investment. There's some costs associated with that. So uh, right off the bat, there's some reduction in terms of uh, uh, burning less natural gas or not burning uh, natural gas to generate steam. You also wouldn't be using uh, as much the water, right? And there is also greenhouse gas emissions from just handling the water and recycling it. And then the other part is may not be as obvious is the there's extra heat loss that often associated with this steam based process, and that is considered to be wasted energy. So think about in underground in the reservoir where so this this part is where I have the reservoir. So imagine this is a piece of rock. I have a lot of oil sitting in the pore space. So in that piece of rock, there's also another piece of rock sitting above and another piece of rock sitting below. So when I inject steam to heat up whatever inside this region, I can avoid having some heat getting lost into the rock above and below. It's just like you're hitting your house. You cannot avoid having some heat loss outside through the windows and other areas, um, the roof and other areas of, of the house. Like that's, um, that's one of the problem. So that's why particularly we found that if, if the reservoir is very thin, so if this, this zone is very thin, it's actually very difficult to, uh, it doesn't really work at all uh, very well for SACD because there's just too much heat lost. The problem uh, is worse if let's say on top of it, usually in this rock, we have some really tight rocks. So very little pore space, fluid doesn't really flow very well. And so we kind of have a seal, a cap rock um, above the reservoir. But what if you also have a zone, which is above the, the oil zone that you're looking at, but it is uh, very porous, you know, lots of pore space, but it's not filled with oil, but it's filled with water. And we call it the top water zone, or we have bottom water zone. Then now when you inject steam into this area, you definitely have heat um, going into these water zones above and below. And these energy that is, uh, will be lost and um, may not, and obviously in, in like this situation, it won't necessarily help you in terms of um, heating up the zone that you are interested in. The other advantage uh, with solvent could be that um, there's some level of in-situ upgrading. So what it what I mean is that if you look at the these bitumen, sometimes they have these super heavy big molecules called asphaltines. So when you inject the solvent, there is some 
some studies that will show that these S14s will basically precipitate. It's just basically form us, um, they get separated out from, from the oil and they got left behind. So as you produce the oil, they just get stay behind. So which is good. So basically you now get rid of these really heavy molecules in the oil and it may reduce some downstream problems during the transportation or even the refining of the oil. So there's some advantages for that. So just to give you an example, we talk about VAPAX, right? Uh, the, in the schematic that I've shown you, uh, some studies have shown it can reduce energy consumption by 97%. And by that, what they mean is that because they reported that about 90% of the solvents can likely be produced back. So when you inject a solvent into the, uh, into the reservoir, the solvent essentially would just mix with the oil and then it will, when you flow it, uh, the oil back to the well, the solvent will come, uh, will be recycled and be produced at the well as well. Um, and the reason they come up with that 97% was that they basically was just comparing um, the, what we call latent heat of vaporization of water and solvent. So while that means it's just a fancy name to basically say, this is the amount of energy that it requires to turn something in a liquid to a gas. So vapor is like a gas. So imagine you have a pot of water sitting on the stove is at 100 degrees C. So let's say we're at sort of atmospheric pressure. It takes a certain amount of energy to convert that pot of water to steam at 100 degrees Celsius. So even if water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, it takes some energy to convert liquid water at 100 degrees Celsius to steam at 100 degrees Celsius. So all they're doing is that they compare that energy for water, because we're talking about steam, again, these solvents. So for example, like propane and butane, or what, how much energy it takes to convert that propane or butane liquid from liquid to gas. So they found that if you do that comparison, it's about 3%. Um, so that's the number that they have reported. So with that, I'm sure in your mind, you're thinking, why does solvent work? Well, um, I think most of us probably familiar with the term solvents by thinking of, um, uh, for example, the most common solvent is water. You know, when we have water, you can dissolve a lot of uh, solutes such as salt in it, right? So if you put salt in water, you mix it, the salt is dissolved or sugar, it dissolves into the water. So water certainly is the most common solvent. So in this case, you can think of it as by adding these solvents such as like propane or butane, it dissolves the bitumen in it. So in a way it's, it's mixed with the salt, uh, mixed with the bitumen and then the whole mixture is just become less viscous. So in the same context, by adding solvent, you can reduce viscosity. So here I have graphs to show you. So if I plot sort of the, um, the oil viscosity uh, on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis, I'm plotting the percent of propane dissolved in it. So for example, in, at the, if I have zero propane dissolved, that means it is just bitumen, no propane in it. But if I can somehow mix in some propane in that uh, liquid, the more I can add in the propane, the easier it's gonna flow. So you can see at, for example, 13 degrees Celsius, uh, if you add certain amount of propane into the, the mixture, you can see that the, you can reduce the viscosity. Now, this doesn't get as low as what we were hoping with the steam. If you remember the steam, I show you, it get down to about like less than 10. So this one is not, so it's about 20 in this particular case. And if you increase the temperature, so if you have everything at a higher temperature, you can now have it um, even reduce a little bit uh, more, right? And into the thousands range. And that's what we saw previously too, heat helps. So this is the range that we're looking at. So um, just a kind of a very quick history of the solvent technologies in case you're wondering, so what have people been doing? Has company really tested this idea? And it's not a complete list. There are so many different ones. Um, this is just kind of a list. And I also have included if 
any of you like to look at it in further detail, I even have some additional references uh, later on. You can look at the video and if you can dig up some resources. But um, these are different process. Like some of them are called uh, VAPEX, ESAGD, um, expanding solvent, SAP, SAS, NSOF, warm VAPEX, EM VAPEX. Um, so what is it, uh, the difference between different ones is almost like different combinations. You can see some of them inject a vaporized means a gas solvent. So say like propane at room temperature. That's, that's one of the one that they've been introduced. Uh, later on, people start to think, what if I add something, a solvent that is a little heavier? So for example, hexane. Hexane has uh, six uh, carbon atoms. So it's a little heavier and it makes a little bit better with the oil. Or some other people start to combining and say, well, how about I, when I do SACD, I just add a little bit of uh, solvent into it and do it and inject them together. So there's some different variations. Some of them do cycles, right? We talk about that cyclic uh, steam st uh, stimulation process. So sometimes people combine solvent and steam in certain cycles. We also talk about, uh, there are also people uh, talk about maybe heating up the solvent and before we, we, we put it into the reservoir. So that's also another technique. And even something as recently, um, there are companies that talk about doing this uh, process where they basically do it like two stage. Start off with something more like SACD. You add the steam and heat up the reservoir to a certain temperature and then you stop and then just inject solvent. And so that way you don't have to keep injecting steam. So at the end, um, I think the message I want to have is just there are just many recipes. There's also many solvent types. Uh, you can have light hydrocarbons, right? That are uh, low molecular weight. So they are like propane. Propane has uh, three carbon atoms. So they will remain as gas, even when you inject them down hole. You can also have slightly heavier hydrocarbons, as I said, like hexane, and they would be condensing, meaning that after you inject them into the reservoir, they become a liquid. So if you want to mix a liquid and liquid, of course, it makes better than if you have a gas and a liquid and try to mix. Uh, some people would start uh, also want to explore the use of CO2. Um, so it's like um, killing two birds with one stone, right? You can minimize this, uh, greenhouse gas emissions by actually using it to produce even more oil. There are many also configuration uh, type, you know, uh, one is like the SACD type where you have the two wells, right, that drill uh, together. So an injector and the producer, you can also have a single well kind of configuration like the CSS process. It can be cyclic, it can be continuous, and then to soak or not to soak, right? Yeah, different process might uh, require so, um, uh, people are testing different combinations of these to see what works the best. Um, just uh, and a couple of slides just to mention that um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with also the term coal production. So some of the heavy oil in Alberta, they are not as viscous. And that's why I say heavy oil. They're not bitumen. They're not uh, their viscosity range is uh, within that sort of 10,000 kind of center points range. So in those cases, we have been doing something called coal production, particularly in the area around Lloydminster. So what we do is we drill a vertical well. And if you look at it from the side, what it is is that these uh, uh, formation are what we call loosely consolidated. So they are not really, um, so maybe to give you an example, if you go to a, a beach, you look at, pick up a bunch of sand in your hand, they're not sticking together. They're just basically nothing binding the sand grains together. So loosely consolidated means that they're not um, so overly bounded to, to one another. So meaning that if I reduce the pressure at my well, I would actually be able to produce the oil together with the sand sand uh, into the well bore. So what happens is as you start producing, you create like a void space and we call these uh, channels or wormholes and they're basically in a little high, highly permeable tunnels. And then all the sand and the oil and gas will, will basically come into the well bore. Now these productions are um, uh, cold, heavy oil production with sand, we call it chops well. This chops well, um, if you look at it, um, I know this slide look a little technical, but uh, all I'm trying to show you is that the, if the blue 
is sort of the background. These red little lines are basically where the channels are. So they look like a, almost like a little uh, snowflake pattern. So as time goes, these, pa these uh, uh, wormholes or channels just grow further and further away from the well. The well would be in the middle of every picture. So I, at, at 31 days, so one month, two months, three months, four months. And that's kind of the distribution of the what the, the, the wormholes are. So what they found is that um, these type of process are okay. Like they produce uh, the sand, as you can see. So you have the oil, the sand, the water, and there's also some gas that is also produced. Um, and these are some examples of of these, what these uh, wormholes kind of look like. As I said, they kind of look like different patterns of the snowflakes. Uh, the problem with that is these type of wells um, doesn't really recover too much of the oil, usually about 10%. And um, they're what we call primary production. So meaning that they, um, you just lower the pressure, something is flowing into the well bore. Uh, what we can also use solvents for, for these type of wells is to do something called pose chops. So after chops is an enhanced recovery method that we inject again solvents, so like hydrocarbons or CO2. And we will do often do some sort of a cyclic solvent injection. So very similar to the cyclic steam stimulation process. So we inject the solvent and then we're going to soak, wait, and then we're going to produce. And we found that if we can do that, you can reduce, you can recover another maybe 20 to 40 percent of the oil. Now, why is that important? Well, in terms of the reducing the environmental footprint, think about it. Instead of just keep drilling additional wells to do chops, what about we can turn some of the existing wells into post chops wells? So you don't have to drill additional well. You just have to inject the solvent to recover additional oil, so it will be more efficient. So that would be another way that we can incorporate solvents to for um, cleaner oil production. So this is just a picture I kind of try to show you uh, these different cycles that uh, you can do. And if you uh, inject different cycles, and this is on the right hand side is where the solvents are. So you can see if the well is like right in the middle of this pattern that looks like a so snowflake, the solvent as you, as you keep injecting would just travel away from the well that we have. So I think it's time to, we should take a little break <laughs> and, and see if there are any questions from the audience. Awesome. Uh, I have learned so much in the last uh, half an hour. Uh, so some of the questions we got, uh, do you think it's possible for us to ever transition to an oil-free economy? Um, do you have an idea of what that timeline would look like? Is it ever possible? See, a lot of these forecasts, if you look at it, they don't really forecast beyond 2040. So at most, sometimes like 2050. So it's hard to see whether, um, and even when they do forecast, I have seen something that will show almost oil and gas become essentially very little, but they always almost have a disclaimer and say, in order to achieve that, you basically need to completely transform the way our society is functioning, our energy grid. And, and so they often, kind of give you the picture, yeah, you can achieve that, but they don't give you a pathway to how to get there. So I don't think I've ever seen a, um, a forecast that based on current policies and announced policies and based on what um, sort of a realistic policy basis and come up with a forecast that we don't need oil and gas after maybe 30 years. But who knows, right? I don't know whether 200 years from now or even maybe less than that, right? Like even 50, 60 years from now, what that uh, may be. It's true. I mean, as slow as it takes for technologies to change, they do change eventually. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions we got was, uh, I'm not clear how the solvent is recovered. Could you explain how it is extracted from the ground after being used? Oh, so yes, but so when you inject these solvents, say like propane, so after you inject it, it'll actually mix with the uh, bitumen. So it basically, so the bit, it goes into the bitumen. So think of it as it goes into the bitumen, into the liquid. So when they flow to the well, inside that liquid, there will be some solvent in it. So actually we will, um, in this solvent process, we have to spend the effort to actually recycle the solvent. So separate the solvent out of the, 
uh, uh, the bitumen or the oil and then reuse it again. Recycling is always yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Frank is wondering how we recycle it out, how we separate it out from the bitumen. So they usually will have, uh, it's uh, based on certain chemical process. So we will have some facilities at the surface that they will actually have to, you can always, uh, just like uh, an oil has many different components. So there are um, techniques to basically separate out different fractions of the oil. And that's why even in the, you get gasoline at the gas station, that's, that's not all the oil that we get out. It's a fraction of the oil that we get out. So we can do something similar to take, take that out. Okay. Uh, do producers use both surface and in situ recovery at the same site, or does it tend to be one or the other? Uh, probably what... <sighs> Usually in a similar area, like we talk about the, they would have, operators certainly have both. Like if you think of a major operator, they would have operations to do service mining and uh, SAGD, but maybe not at the exact same location because as you're digging, you can imagine it would be hard to, to drill another well at the exact same spot that you are digging. But, and so they might target it in, in, but the deposit might be in a general vicinity, that whole area that we have this deposit, then they will figure out a way to, to access them. So maybe not exactly in the same location. Uh, but for the same reservoir. Yes, yeah. Okay, uh, we had a couple of questions regarding the effect of the solvents on the environment. Uh, does the solvent, or how much of the solvent leaches into the surrounding soil and rock does it have to be remediated after? Does it have an impact on the environment? So, um, so it is a bit, so remember we show a picture of, um, when I show a picture of how there's a rock above and below, right? So for heat, is you can imagine, it's very easy to get out. So for solvent, it's not as easy to get out to the top and the bottom because often the top and the bottom are um, rocks that are very tight. So. It, it's actually just very hard. Just like the oil can get to the top, the solvent also wouldn't get to the top, but it is potentially that it will just be somewhere around the reservoir. So actually we do try to keep track of where it is, but primarily it's, it's if it's not, you can do some also modeling studies to figure out where they are, but what we usually found if it's not recovered, it basically just gets stuck with the oil uh, in it in the oil that cannot be recovered. Uh, and I guess similarly, do the precipitated asphaltines that are left behind have an impact or are they so deep underground that um, that contamination won't uh, influence the surrounding environment? So they are there already. So even if you're not producing the bitumen, they are inside the bitumen. So it's just that by having the solvent, it sort of um, caused it to kind of become a solid and precipitate and come out. So they usually just get stuck in, and actually it's not necessarily, it depends, like uh, here I kind of say that it's a good thing. So it is a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing in the sense that they might pluck up some of the pores because there's the precipitation, it's like scaling, right? So it kind of pluck up some of the areas. So kind of, uh, that's why it is one area that we are, uh, a lot of research is going on to understand uh, so that if you can control it, that would be good, right? Then you know, you you can use it to your advantage and not causing any problems. Very true. Um, would using carbon dioxide as a solvent uh, be a type of carbon capture? Does that carbon dioxide actually stay underground? So this is interesting. So um, carbon capture storage, by definition, I, I think what we usually think of is something that keep the carbon dioxide underground for forever or as long as we can, you know, a long, long time. But in this particular case, it is because the fact that you produce the solvent back, so you will recycle it. So it's not like it will stay there. So there may be some that would stay there because it got stuck with the oil that underground, but it's not, um, you cannot put in as much as in like, a, if you're thinking about like geological storage of CO2, where we put these uh, CO2 in like deep aquifer, say saline aquifer, it's not um, in the same context, but at least you are using it to do something rather than <laughs> 
right? Instead of like trying to get the solvents, like CO2 is already something that you wanted to get rid of. Now you're doing something with it. Very true. Uh, and then this will be our last question for now. So if you do have more burning questions, store them up for later. Uh, but is it easy to switch current wells to run on solvents instead? Does the infrastructure have to change? Um, it's not as much like, so that's why I, I think I will touch on some of that is examples later on. Um, uh, some operators are already doing that. They will turn some of the SAG D operations and they just play with it. Maybe add a little bit of solvents and then try to, um, and, and try to see what happens. So it's not, um, and, and a lot of these configurations, the well configurations is exactly what you have been dealing with with SACD or other um, uh, steam-based techniques anyway. So, um, so supposedly it doesn't cost too much of uh, capital investment to convert everything, but there might be some, like obviously you need some service facilities to do the recycling and, and that kind of operations. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. Uh, we will chat more at the end. All right. Thank you. So uh, let's continue with the second part of the presentation. So now that we all have some idea about what uh, solvents and why do we need them, so let's uh, tackle some of the tougher questions, are, such as what are the challenges with solvent technology, right? If you if, you know, we talk about how great it is and, and how come people are not using it right away. One of the challenge, the maybe uh, the first challenge is that solvent is just less efficient compared to steam. Now by that, what I mean is viscosity reduction is not as dramatic as adding steam. And I think I've kind of um, alluded to that earlier on when I show you a slide where there's, uh, uh, if you're adding steam, you can really reduce the viscosity. Whereas to like maybe less than 10, but when I add the solvents such as propane, it doesn't really decrease the viscosity to the same level. So this is what I meant by it's not as efficient. Now the higher, um, so what it could potentially also mean is the higher cost. So solvent cost more. It, it costs money to recycle, but imagine you're also using uh, propane, they are a uh, propane, butane, or even hexane. The heavier it is, the more expensive it is. So there's a cost associated with it. And there could be, as someone was asking too, you might need, do need some new infrastructure and equipment, although maybe you can practice it on existing wells and you don't have to um, um, drill additional wells to test it, for example. It, it's a new operating procedure, so uh, you need to maybe optimize it or design the operating procedure to make good use of the solvents. But I think, um, and that's kind of brings to a more the other aspect is, you know, some people may argue, well, with the lower oil price and companies are not interested in solvents. So this is, um, uh, it may not work. But I think we do have to keep in mind is that ultimately, eventually, we need to think of other things that may not have a direct price tax on, but it is important. One thing is like social license to operate. Companies, if you want investors, they probably care about whether they're doing anything to help with the environment. I don't think it is okay to just kind of um, assume that all this is going to go away and, and that is that is important. And a lot of companies have commitment to reduce their carbon uh, emissions. And so there's all these other aspects. And, you know, a lot of places may have a pretty, um, you know, talk about carbon taxing, uh, taxing, and, and it might be controversial, but at the end, this is uh, sort of the environment that they have to operate in. So um, this is something that they may have to think about even when it comes to solvents. So if the point is that if, if you think, if you only think about just steam and water, maybe the economics won't work out for solvent. But if you start thinking about all of these as part of the cost, then you might start to think that maybe solvent is, uh, is uh, something that you need to consider as well. So um, some of you start asking about how the solvent works. So I thought that uh, I should show you a little bit about the uh, what is the physics that goes uh, into the solvent. So um, the challenge number two actually has to be, is actually related to that is because the physics is actually quite complicated. Um, so what it is, is that if you think about you have a, um, oil, 
you add solvent in one end, this is what the picture would look like. So blue would be your oil or your liquid. And if you add like a um, solvent, which is like a gas, so like propane, this is what it will look like. So uh, after, so if you inject it and maybe after some time, you would start to see that the, the solvent will start mixing, going into the oil. And once you go into the oil, then the viscosity of that oil will be reduced. So this is a system which we call involving at least two phases. Now phases in this context and phases would mean like liquid and gas. So this would be like two phases. Um, so when I say at least two phases is because I, in this picture, I didn't include, for example, water. Water doesn't mix with oil. So if you think of water, you may also have the solvent and then the oil, and then you might still have water sitting around somewhere. And the solvent, basically, if you inject like propane, it has somehow have to travel all the way to the interface and go across the interface, which is like a boundary between the two phases, and to get into the oil. So to help you visualize, I have a little schematic. So let's take a look at what goes on near that interface. So the red one would be your gas, the blue one would be your liquid. So I have some solvent particle right here. So as I inject it, it's gonna slowly travel through the gas phase. When it gets to the interface, it has to somehow get across that interface and then go in further into the, bitumen, the liquid phase of the bitumen. And once it has enough, bitch, uh, uh, enough solvent into the bitumen, this bitumen will now flow to the producer. So its viscosity would be reduced. That's why I represent it with the lighter blue color, and then it will flow to the producer. So another picture to think about it is I, if I put in some gas, like a propane on top of the liquid, which is like a bitumen, at the beginning, this is what it will look like. If you let it sit for some time, you'll find that some of the propane will go into the bitumen. And then you have, uh, it will go, once it goes in, the bitumen or the liquid will have a lower viscosity. So now it can flow easily to the well bore. So there's, uh, once it goes in, actually it also sort of have some mixing within the bitumen and then it uh, it's get produced. Now, but the reservoir in the ground does not exist uh, in a pool. Uh, so what it is, is it is a piece of rock. Underground, it's all rock. So in the fluids, so if you think about oil, water, gas, whatever you have, it actually exists inside that little pore space between the grains. And that presents another level of problem. So here's a picture. So rock is a porous medium. So another example could be bone. Bone is also a porous medium. So if you think of a piece of rock, so I kind of like take a take this piece of uh, rock and kind of like zoom in to uh, many, many, many times. And so you can see the, the red part is the pore space. The white is the grain. So it's like little sand grain, for example. And in between, I have some pore space. And now it is filled with oil, so it's the red color. If I inject some solvent in here, so I'm gonna inject it right at this end on the left-hand side, what it will happen is after some time, the solvent would travel through this pore space, mix with the oil, and once it got mixed with the oil, this part where there's a color change, it will start flowing into the well bore. And so this mixing of the solvents, getting the solvent into the oil is key to getting this uh, oil to be produced. And these whole physical mechanisms are very complex. You can do experiments to try to look at these at like the super magnified uh, scale. And we, some of my colleagues do that. We sometimes create models at this level and create sort of an artificial porous medium to try to see where the solvents are going. And, you know, here I kind of show it like it's, it's like a color, right? So 
it's easy to see, but often if you imagine these are gas, they, there's no color to it. You have to figure out a way to even see where the solvent is. So you may have to do some imaging technique to even just to figure out where the solvent is in this whole medium. So there are a lot of physics that goes into about how the sort of the interface, which is like the boundary between the gas and the liquid is moving and also where the solvents are distributed within this phase. So uh, a lot of um, complex physics is, is kind of going on. So that makes things kind of difficult. And the third challenge is that the subsurface formation is actually very heterogeneous. So what I meant is that rocks, are com uh, the formation actually composed of many different types of rocks and they have very dissimilar characteristics. This is a picture I took last year when I went to Drumheller and um, you can see, even just by looking at these rocks, there are just many different colors, many different properties. And this is exactly what you would see in the subsurface, the underground. Uh, a lot of these bitumen and oil sands are located in reservoirs that have a lot of sand. So they have big pores, well connected. So in theory, very easy for oil and the solvent to flow. And so the challenge is not about the the formation being tight, it's just because the fluid is very viscous. But occasionally, you will see areas where uh, in the reservoir, you have something called sh like shales. So shales are tiny pores that are super tiny pores and they're poorly connected. Or you just have some sand that we, it's, it's just mixed with a little bit of these shales so that they they are not as porous and connected anymore. And they act as barriers to flow. So a barrier to oil is also a barrier to your solvents. So these um, create um, a lot of problems for us. So this is kind of visually to show you what may happen if you have a shear barrier. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through these uh, pictures that I have. So each of these picture is what happens uh, over a time scale from one year to 15 years is the results from us uh, modeling studies that we perform. So you can look at it as, it's like I can cut open a reservoir. So this is like a cross section. I cut, over, cut open a reservoir and sort of be able to look at where it is. So these blue lines are barriers. So think of this, maybe shales, whatever, these are some barriers to flow. The red and the, so the black line and the sort of the red uh, shaded area is where the solvents are. So if you think about it, so as for example, right next to the solvent, uh, the barriers, you can see the solvents is kind of stuck. It couldn't get past the barrier. The barrier is stopping it from uh, moving away from the well. So that's a problem. I want the solvent to contact the oil as much as they can. But if I have these barriers that blocking them, then they're not going where I want it to go. So that could be a problem. So in this picture, I, uh, if you're wondering uh, what this blue line, uh, sorry, the red line and the black lines are, these are just uh, predictions with different models, but the um, different models might predict slightly different things. But the key message is still that these barriers do uh, stop the solvent from going to where you wanted it to go. So that's uh, uh, another problem. Then, okay, fine. Then you say, well, but it's not really a problem if you know where the barriers are. And you're right, but the reality is we really don't know. And I think the best analogy to think about it is, um, this is a picture of a puzzle. So if I don't let you, so don't look at the picture of the box. If you just look at this puzzle and I asked you, well, guess what this puzzle is? You will know, I see some orange there, I see some darker color, I have no idea what this is. Maybe it's a sunset, that's about it. So that's essentially what we have when we deal with subsurface um, formations. Oftentimes what we do is, where do you get data? You drill wells. And when you drill wells, you are somewhat biased. No one wants to purposely drill into a location where there's no oil. You drill an area where you think it has a lot of oil, good sand, this is what you do. So you collect some data for these wells, these very specific locations, and I don't know anything about it for anywhere else in between these wells. Now, um, with so the, what happens is that you have to deal with very limited data, and I have to make an interpretation of 
how the rock characteristics or how the rock uh, properties or the characteristics of the rock might vary in between these wells that I didn't collect any data. And so at the end, if I don't know or if there is uncertainty in where these barriers are located, that means it's very hard to predict and even to determine where the injected solvents would be inside the reservoir. So because I don't know where the barriers are, I inject the solvents. Now I am hoping that it will go where I, it's supposed to go, but maybe these barriers will, will stop it and it didn't go the way where I wanted it to go. So there could be, as I said, so uh, solvent loss would be in the form of this oil. Solvent may be stuck with the oil and they get and cannot be produced. So it just sits there. So what are some potential solutions that we can have? Um, one is a hybrid process. Um, and so what I meant is um, solvents alone, as we said, it doesn't reduce the viscosity to the same extent that uh, steam would have, but you can also maybe do something a hybrid, like a combination of solvent and heat. Now, the obvious choice would be add some solvent to steam, and that's what a lot of operators have tried. The other one could be electromagnetic heating, so meaning an other way. So think of electromagnetic heating is just basically um, turning electricity into some sort of a heating. So an example could be that you, um, in simplest term, maybe take a piece of rock, you try to polarize the rock, and then the rock grains, they would basically vibrate. And as they vibrate, it creates heat, right? So um, it's like the rock was like shivering and then they create heat. And that heat can be used uh, together with the solvents um, to, to actually enhance the process. Like I have another colleague in my department, they look at, for example, injecting solvents in like a microwave often in a way, right? Then they can see how the uh, solvent actually works better at these uh, under those conditions. So you're not using steam, you're basically using other form of creating heat. Um, another technique that people think about is how about we preheat the solvent and then we add it. So you don't have to preheat it to the same temperature as the steam, but you can at least increase it to maybe like uh, um, a little bit higher, maybe 50 degrees Celsius or whatever that is before you inject it and that helps. And that can also be used with existing SACT and CSS wells, right? So that's why um, some people are testing it. They might pick uh, one of their SACT pads and area that they are doing well, and then they start injecting some solvents into it and see how it looks like. So on this picture, it looks a little busy, but what I'm just trying to show you, just so there are so many different combinations, just like how I have alluded to earlier on. Um, on the left-hand side of these uh, sort of like a cross are process where you're using only solvents, like uh, no adding steam. Whereas on the right are some process that we will still combine solvent with some little bit of steam. So whenever you have steam, you have high temperature. And, but if you only talk about solvent, you can have it both at high temperature or at low temperature. So for example, if you're using solvent at high temperature, you can have something called warm VPAX, right? So it's continuous solvent, uh, so you no cycles. You just keep adding solvent all the time, but you, you warm it up before you add it in. You can also have other ones where you either do some cyclic or continuous ones, so such as VPAX and CSI. That um, The one that with the post chops that I was talking about, so the uh, cyclic solvent injection process. So they would be at lower temperature. These are processes that um, uh, are using solvent and some steam. So we call it um, expanding solvent SACD, EM VAPEX, or that uh, solvent aided process. A lot of these are proprietary process uh, developed by specific operators as well. And then you have uh, these uh, cyclic one way, maybe you would do add, inject steam for a little bit and then you inject uh, solvent and then you go back to steam and solvent and just some cycles, right? So that could be something. Now you might say, um, does that uh, help? Well, 
if you're injecting steam, maybe you can argue, well, you're still using steam, but you're not using as much, right? Like you will basically, instead of just continuously injecting steam, some part of the process, you will stop the steam injection and use solvents. So there should be some greenhouse gas emissions uh, for those process. Now, operators are testing different pilots. Like I'm here just naming uh, a couple of them. Like for example, Synovas will talk about using their, they have been doing uh, that uh, piloting that uh, SAP process which if, according to the website, they add some natural gas liquid to the steam and they can reduce the steam oil ratio by a third. Uh, Mag Energy also in the past few years, uh, they claim that they're doing something with the EM VPAX process that they, um, it's like a two uh, stage process. They inject steam for some time and get the temperature up to a certain temperature. And then they follow by adding like a gas solvent and they they can reduce the steam injection to and then i think in that stage then you don't need to inject any more steam so it has a potential of reducing sor and they also claim that because of that it's um reduce some greenhouse gas emissions by reducing the amount of steam and the water handling at the facility so you less cost but also you don't need to spend your energy on dealing with uh uh, the steam and the water. So that is one uh, solution. So we're working on looking at um, people are trying to do this hybrid process. The second one is to, we try to do investigation of how uh, the solvents will work best under different conditions. So this slide is a little bit more technical because it goes into a little bit about trying to understand the physics. But the ultimate message um, is that we just want to know, have a better prediction of how this solvent will mix with the oil. So the things we look at is how does the solvent interact with the rock and the oil? And by interaction, one way would be how does it affect that asphaltine precipitation? Right, we want to understand better how the solvent molecules will go across the interface and get into the oil. How can we manipulate this interface or what conditions would allow this solvent to just mix better? Right, we, the ultimate goal is to get the solvent into the bitumen. If you cannot get the solvent into the bitumen, nothing works. So whatever you do, you try to get as much solvent as you can, somehow get it into the bitumen so that the viscosity would reduce and then it can flow to the well. And different temperature and different pressure conditions cause different response. So we also want to have a better understanding of uh, how uh, they are response, uh, how they respond to different to changes in temperature and pressure. So, for example, if you really try to optimize a a particular process, let's say you are trying to heat up your solvent before you add it in, at what temperature should I heat it up to? Right? Maybe you would think, yeah, the the higher the better, but do you really get um, is the incremental benefit really higher or it's just a little bit better, right? So it costs energy to also heat up these solvents. So these are things that you want to have a better understanding so that you can potentially uh, design a more efficient process. Now, finally, it's about optimizing this process. And this is an area that I, I myself also is particularly interested in because uh, we've been doing some research using machine learning and AI to help us optimize this process. So for example, let, let's think about it. If, if you have these operations here that I'm injecting something, I at the well, I usually collect a lot of data. I collect um, the rate data, meaning that how much oil is coming into the well bore, how much solvent or steam I'm injecting. So I, I know that, that I will try to measure. So I have those rate versus time kind of data. Another set of data I often get could be some temperature information. So temperature is one example. We now have these uh, fiber optics uh, uh, distributed sensing. So you can imagine there are some tools that we can run in the wellbore and I can collect the temperature along this entire wellbore. So I know what the temperature distribution is like. So from this type of data, I can try to now figure out, I wanted to figure out, first of all, are there any barriers around? Are there any sand coming into my wellbore? Are there any zones inside the reservoir that has a lot of water? And if I have those information, then now I can maybe figure out some way of optimizing and controlling uh, my operating strategy so that I can help 
more oil to be produced, maybe reduce the amount of solvent and even steam that I'm adding and make the process more efficient. And this is basically what uh, we do. So uh, how can we use the data? As I mentioned, uh, infer heterogeneity, i.e. we know where are the barriers, where are the water rich zones, uh, detecting sand production, forecasting production, right? So we also need to predict what is the oil production rate. We need to uh, plan uh, future wells. For, so for example, maybe you find that, okay, this well is not performing as much as I want, or it doesn't seem to produce all the oil in the surrounding area. Maybe I need to drill another well next to it to make sure I get all the oil out. So that could be, um, uh, those data will help me to make these decisions. So when it comes to optimizing things that I can control, like obviously I can control what solvent I'm adding. So by composition, I mean like, do I just want to add pure propane? Do I want to mix in propane with some, uh, with for example, methane, which has one carbon and a little lighter? Um, what, what temperature should I inject at? What pressure should I have? Should I do cycles? How long should these cycles be? Half a year, two months, whatever that is, however number of cycles that I need. And we can also do something called um, flow control devices, meaning that you can also, uh, these are things that basically along that well bore, if I go back, I can put in some device in there that basically control how much steam is coming in. So you might think that I have to, uh, the steam have to be injected, for example, evenly everywhere. It doesn't have to be. I can actually control it so that um, certain areas get a bit more or also not all the wellbore has to be, for the producer has to be opened the same way. I can also control it so the certain sections get a little bit more oil. So these are something that we can control. Um, so that's, uh, that's where the flow control devices, you can control this injection and the production rate, uh, rate and also do some sort of pad wise optimization. So if you remember that I said these SACD wells are often drilled from a pad, meaning the same surface location and multiple sets of wells coming out. And um, we often do something called allocation in the sense that because uh, solvents are or steam, you may have limited amounts. So you cannot just inject whatever you want into every single well you, you have in the pad. You might have to control which well get more or less. So that's, that's some sort of optimization that you have. So it's just like us, if you have a limited budget, you have to prioritize. So maybe certain wells get a little bit more than the others. Um, we use computer models often to uh, do these analysis. These are some pictures of our computer models. So if this is like, imagine your reservoir is like a box and these blue areas are, are the barriers. So we can do some very fancy computer models uh, to um, predict what's going on. But these models are very time consuming to run. So it might take some you know, sometimes a day or so to, to run a model. So um, machine learning or AI will help in some way. So if I know you hear a lot of this in the media, oftentimes people talk about AI, machine learning. So for those of you that are not familiar with that, it's just think of it as, as, as you're using computer algorithms to build models based on some training data. And these machine learning model can help us to predict some outputs based on some inputs. So I thought there's an example to just to give you an idea. If the problem is there's a baby, the baby is crying, what to do? Well, if you're doing this explicit modeling, you would model something, you create a model that says, okay, ask, you know, when was the last feeding? Does it need a diaper change? Uh, uh, does it have a fever? And then so on and so forth. And then at the end, it will program to give you an action. So this is very explicitly, you're programming a series of conditions that you would check and come up with an action. When you use machine learning, you don't do that. Instead, you're gonna gather some data for a thousand baby crying cases. For each case, for example, I have two cases here, you have some inputs. So the input could be, okay, uh, the baby was fed three hours ago, not very smelly, no fever. So the output action for that case was that you should feed the baby. Whereas another case maybe, oh, the baby was just fed, but then, you know, kind of smelly, no fever, the output is that you need a diaper change. So if I have a, a thousand of these scenarios, I can basically train a model that next time, when there is a baby crime, I'm just, just gonna input 
these conditions. And then let the model tells me what is the action. So I don't have to explicitly list a bunch of a chain of actions that, or a chain of conditions that I check. Instead, it just directly split out the output. Now back to the problem that we are looking at. So how does that relate to what we're doing? So for example, one example I have is about inferring or inferring where are the barriers. So if I have a case where I have a thou instead of thousand baby crying case, I'm gonna create a thousand models with different configurations or arrangement of these barriers. I'm gonna run them through my uh, fancy computer models and get all the response. So I create an artificial data set of a thousand models. And the process is I'm injecting some warm solvent, some mixture of methane and propane, and I have a thousand of these case. I'm going to run it through a set of very uh, different types of machine learning models and based on some statistical analysis and some sort of uh, computer algorithm. So it will take those profiles that I've shown you earlier on and it will spit out where the barriers are located. It will tell me how many they are, where are they, how big they are, are they close to the wells. It would even tell me where the solvents may be located based on this data. And you can train that, you can train models that, that do that. So this will help because in the future, if I have a model that already been trained it and doing all this, it's like a little robot. Next time when I collect these inputs from my well, I can just feed that into the robot or that model. And then it will tell me where the barriers are or if there are any. So that would be uh, very useful. Another one could be just basically also spit out what you should be doing. So again, um, you, um, these are just sort of some output from a publication that we have, but what it basically showing is telling me how to operate the well. Should I lower the pressure of the well? Should I inject, uh, inject at a higher pressure? And should I use longer cycles, shorter cycles? It was basically based on those type of information. So it would split out those kind of information. So um, your goal is to increase your oil production reduced your solvent usage. And you can also add in many other objectives that you may have. Maybe you all, your goal also is to reduce the energy consumption. Maybe you can also add uh, carbon emission as a, um, as a constraint. So you don't want to have too much carbon emissions. So that could be another one. And also some of you, this one may be, um, for those of you that are familiar with AI, you know, we also hear sometimes the term deep learning. Um, it's basically a more advanced machine learning algorithm that are very good for dealing with continuous streams. So large amount of images and videos, um, they're good for recognizing patterns and things, so certain features in your data and also help you to make automatic uh, uh, decision making. So sometimes the challenge is how do you, we call it parameterization, but basically it's how do you manipulate these raw data that you get into some sort of meaningful inputs and also uh, formulating them into outputs. Um, so the possibility are endless. Like if you look at the, uh, there's a digital sort of a transformation within the petroleum industry and oil and gas industry as well. We often use these techniques to predict equipment failure, uh, Conformance management is basically a fancy word to saying, does the solvent go where I want it to go? And you use flow control device and then uh, to help you um, uh, control that in some way, uh, inferring heterogeneity and also production forecasts. Uh, and there are also a lot of opportunities I think I want to. So with this, I just kind of want to say, um, uh, although there's a lot of opportunity for collaborating with colleagues over in computer science, um, they provide the expertise in terms of the algorithm and um, engineers and scientists in, in working in the oil and gas um, uh, geoscientists, for example, and engineers would have the expertise to provide the we call it the domain knowledge because we know what the data tells us physically. So we can combine that to create algorithm that works for our particular application. So I think there are a lot of uh, opportunities for that collaboration and there are other signature area, for example, within the University of Alberta that looks into uh, these interdisciplinary aspect. 
So uh, con conclusions, I, uh, within this talk, I, we looked at some aspects of a bitumen production. So we know what is bitumen, why is it difficult to produce that, and why is it more GHG in, uh, intensive than a typical conventional oil production uh, strategy, and what are some existing production methods. And I hope that you um, uh, can get some idea about why solvent could be an enabling technology for cleaner heavy oil production. And uh, I believe that the path forward should be cleaner oil and gas production and development of renewables. And project uh, economics are the key concern. If we really want this to be more widely adopted, I think people need to think about the cost the cost would be uh, one thing, the oil price is another thing, but also the price tag that we placed on our environmental footprint. And lots of research, both in academia and industry, they're doing pilot testing, right, of these different technology. And we look at aspects, both from the physics point of view, from optimizing using AI, uh, there's experimental work going on uh, by some of my colleagues as well. And then doing computer modeling work, uh, some of the colleagues also looking at the economics and also like this life cycle assessment, right? Looking at whether, what is the overall impact on, on emissions. So finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, Future Energy Systems. Uh, they supported a lot of the research that we do in this area. And also very importantly, my dedicated team of grad students, they helped me over the years to produce all these wonderful research and they even helped me create some of the graphics that I have in this presentation. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we were actually commenting how great your graphics were. So well done, oh, grad you. students, and yeah. you, bravo. Uh, so we have a few more questions from the audience. Uh, one is, can the temperature of warm vapex reach the temperature of steam? Uh, we usually do do that. So steam would be like 200 something degree, uh, uh, which would be, the other one would be warm, would be around like maybe 40, 50. All right. Um, for the AI work, was the input data from commercial operations or was it lab generated data? So it depends. So in this case, I only show the uh, com like computer generated data, but uh, some of our projects involve uh, industrial partners and they will um, provide their own data uh, to, to test. Uh, and then with this mach machine learning, can the producers create their own models or do they generally partner with a university um, to create the models and you would give them back the information? They will. So a lot of the times um, they will work with the university maybe in the context of developing or testing different algorithm, but ultimately they would want to learn from that and create their own model because when they create the models, they need to use a lot of the data. And these are things that they don't necessarily want to share or to publish. So they would take your method and then they try to use their own data to create their own. And often they have their own in-house software to do these things. And that's where the collaboration um, is. Like they take the developed technology and kind of tailor it to their own work. Uh, we have a question in the chat box. Um, can the trap solvent be burned or heated uh, as the heat source? Um, or does it need to come from the surface? So that I never thought of it that way to actually have the, so, so they have other ways of, um, uh, so yeah, I didn't think of it that way. They, they maybe one of these are, they call it um, sort of in situ um, combustion. I think it's kind of like that. We, um, what they do is like these, uh, maybe they add, maybe not a solvent, but like an oxygen, right? It's like they induce a combustion inside the reservoir and then that heat will kind of produce the, uh, sort of to produce the, the, the heat that is needed to recover the oil. So I think maybe that question was more like along that angle, right? You add the, it's like you add a fuel down there and then you combust it. So, but because there's already fuel down there in some way, right? So. So I, yeah, I, so there's already a lot of oil down there. So you have to control it in a way that, um, so they do, when they do this in situ combustion, they would make sure that it, it's you, you kind of 
um, the combustion leads to some sort of an upgrading rather than just burning all the energy, right? Yeah, you're losing all the energy underground yeah. where you don't need it. Yes. All right. Uh, and the last question, unless there is someone, if unless people have anything else to add, uh, is what happens to these in situ oil wells when they're empty? When they may be empty? Uh, what happens to the oil wells when you no longer can extract anything from that site? Oh, so just like most of the field, you eventually have to, we call it abandon it. So once it below a certain economic limit, it, you probably still have oil in there. It's just you cannot produce it um, and make money out of it, or it's not worth it. You probably put in more energy than the energy that you can get. So what you will all often do is basically, we abandon sounds like a bad word because it's like you just leave it there, but you basically have to properly kind of uh, finish off the well and close it off and kind of reclaim the land and and just plug it up and, and leave it there. That's my area as the land reclamation scientist. Uh, yeah. But uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lung. Uh, that was a fascinating talk. Uh, I'm sure the audience is just wildly clapping in their own living rooms. Uh, but seeing as you can't hear any of them. Thank you. Thank you so them. much for thank inviting you. me. Oh, thank you again. Um, for everyone who attended, thank you all so much. I hope you've learned a great deal about this topic. Uh, and we hope you will join us next month on November 25th. We are having our next talk. Uh, yes, energy transition in my backyard. Uh, it is looking at community leagues and their role in the energy transition. Uh, the link is in the chat. We hope you can attend. Uh, we do these every month. Uh, but thank you all again so much from Future Energy Systems. And Cassidy, I'll pass it off to you for final remarks. Thank you, Valerie, and thank you, Dr. Lung. That was really interesting. I actually had my cousin who works in oil sands texting me because I had posted that I was attending it, and he was asking me questions that I was like, I don't know the answer to. Watch the talk. So uh, I certainly learned a lot. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And as Valerie said, we are doing another talk next month that I'm really excited about as well. And I will be emailing everyone that link as well as a link to a feedback form. So if you have any feedback or even any questions you didn't get to ask or you're thinking about it tonight, feel free to throw them in that feedback and we will send them on to, uh, to who is best to answer them. We would uh, love to hear what topics you're interested in as well for future talks. Uh, you can also sign up for the Future Energy Systems uh, newsletter in that, uh, in that survey. Uh, so thank you all so much. Good, and have a good night, everyone.